All right. Good to see you this morning. Does everybody have a good day? I mean, sunshine makes it better, right? Amen and amen. Several weeks ago, we began a series of sermons on biblical church leadership. And uh, this morning, I want to continue in that series as we turn our attention and our focus uh, towards the ministry of deacons. So if you have your Bibles with you, I want you to turn to the book of 1 Timothy. And uh, we'll be looking in 1 Timothy chapter 3 um, for the third week in a row. Uh, this, this week, we're looking at verses 8 through 13. 1 Timothy chapter 3, we'll be looking at verses 8 through 13. Now, I have to tell you up front, <clears throat> and I need to be honest with you, uh, this has been a very challenging passage uh, for me personally uh, to understand and to apply um, in the context of our church. Now, I'm, I'm going to elaborate that on that tonight, uh, but I just want you to know this is a difficult passage, uh, not because it's difficult to read, but uh, because of the way the Greek is used in this passage. The one thing that we need to understand, uh, as I've been repeating, biblical church leadership is a serious matter. And because it's a serious matter, I want to be certain that I'm leading in a way that is faithful to the word. As one uh, pastor reminded me, in the end, we want everything we do in the church to conform to God's design for the church. Now, we've already established that the Bible teaches that there are two offices that are set apart in the church, the office of pastor, sometimes called elder, and the office of deacon. And as we learned a few weeks ago, David Platt is very helpful in understanding these as he describes these offices as servant leaders and leading servants. Uh, so I want to continue to use that uh, to help us understand what it is to be a pastor or elder that is a servant leader and a deacon that is a leading servant. I hope you notice in both of those, the key word there is servant, servant. One pastor said, when God raises up people to serve his church, he looks for those whose hearts are right with him. His concern is not about talents or abilities, but spiritual virtue. This has always been the case for those that God has raised up as leaders. Their hearts have been devoted totally to God. In Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 8, it is said of Abraham, you found his heart faithful before you. When Samuel the prophet was searching to, uh, for a king to replace Saul as he's looking for David, the Lord speaks to him in 1 Samuel 16 and says to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or on the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees, man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks on the heart. Men who are devoted to God. A side note, I'm glad the, the Lord said, don't look on his appearance or the height of his stature. <laughs> we all know what happened with Saul. Saul was a terrible king. It ended up being the disaster. And do you know why the, the people of God chose Saul as king? Because of his stature and his appearance. He looked like a king, but he sure didn't lead like one. David advised his son Solomon as he's getting ready to take over the kingdom. He tells Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and with a willing mind for the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. The heart, the heart. Those who lead in the church must have a heart that, are, that is devoted to, to God. Ezra was used by God in the Old Testament because the scripture says he had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach its statutes and rules in Israel. Here's a man, Ezra, who, who set his heart on the law. He studied it. And not only did he study it, but he lived it out. And then he taught it. He taught the Lord's statutes and the Lord's rules in Israel. A man devoted to God. In 1 Thessalonians 2.10, Paul reminds the Thessalonian church that they were witnesses 
And God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. In other words, Paul is reminding them that he was a man after God's own heart, just like David, just like all biblically called leaders, men who should be devoted, their hearts devoted to God. <coughs> These are the type of men that God chooses to lead his church. When we come to these verses in 1 Timothy chapter 3, Paul's already been um, sharing with Timothy <coughs> and no doubt the Ephesian church what the qualifications of an overseer, or an elder, or a pastor must be. And in verse 8, he switches conversation from pastors to deacons. A deacon must be. Read with me, if you will, in 1 Timothy chapter 3, beginning in verse 8. And there the scripture says, Deacons likewise must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. And let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives likewise must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded, faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. God, we do ask this morning that as we come into your word, God, that we would look with open hearts and open minds to hear what your word teaches us today. God, I pray that you'd give me clarity of speech as I, as I try to explain your word this morning and apply it to our lives. God, I pray above all that you'd be honored and glorified in this time. And it's in your son's name that we pray. Amen and amen. Deacons must be. This should go without saying, but first we need to understand that a deacon must be qualified. A deacon must be qualified. Paul continues to instruct Timothy on leadership in the church here in these verses, and he points out nine characteristics that should be found in a deacon. Now, before anybody goes, oh my gosh, he's about to preach a nine-point sermon, I'm not going to do that this morning. I'm going to do that tonight. Nine characteristics. And if you were listening closely as we read these verses, you would have heard these things. A deacon needs to be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to wine, not greedy for dishonest gain, sound in faith and life, blameless, have a godly wife, the husband of one wife, and managing children and his household well. I like the way that Danny Aiken explained these in a sermon that he preached. He said that a deacon must be a man of character. The word dignity or is really worthy of respect. It speaks to a person's character. He also goes on to say that he must be a man of consistency, not double-tongued, a man of integrity, if you will. He also must be a man of control. He's not to be a drunkard, not to be greedy for dishonest gain. He needs to control these areas in his life that deal with addictions. Fourth, he needs to be a man of consecration, the fact that he knows God's word, but not only does he know it, he also lives it out. He needs to be a man of consideration. That is a man who's been tested and proved blameless. He also needs to be a man of covenant. That is a one woman man, the husband of one wife. He also needs to be a man of commitment. That is, he's committed to be a family man who manages his children and his household well. Now, if you were here last week, you probably realized some of the similarities of these particular characteristics and what we talked about last week when we dealt with pastors. They're essentially the same spiritual qualifications that are given for pastors and elders. The most significant difference between uh, verses 1 through 7 and 8 through 13 is the fact that a pastor or an elder had to have the qualification of being able to teach, where deacons don't have to have that qualification. One other difference is the inclusion of of deacons' wives. This particular verse has been the subject of a lot of debate, and I was quite surprised. I even had to, to uh, tell Cindy last night I was so surprised by some of, some of the pastors that I've listened to in the past, and I read their books and those kind of things, and when I, when I come to the part where they're understanding this verse, it kind of took me aback uh, because that's not exactly the way I interpret the passage. So there's a lot of debate, and if I could sum up the debate, there's a lot of people who believe 
uh, that this speaks to deacons' wives. There's a lot of people who believe uh, that this speaks to a, another class of leadership in the church because the word that's used there for wife uh, in the Greek is the same word that's used for woman. So in your footnote of your Bible, you can look down there and there's a little footnote that might say this reads wives likewise or women likewise. So there's a debate on how Paul uses this word. Is he talking about deacons' wives or is he talking about um, deaconesses? Well, let me, um, I don't want to run by this too, too fast but let me just give you what I believe and how I interpret the scripture. I, I believe that the usage here is wives and that Paul is specifically referring to a deacon's wife. Now, I know some of you might have questions about that, so that's why I encourage you to be back tonight because I'm gonna dig into this a little bit deeper because I don't have time this morning to unpack the whole thing. But this is how I interpret the scripture that this is referring to deacon's wives. So what is it about a deacon wife? Well, they're special. They need to be dignified. They need to not be slanderers. I found that word interesting because that, that literally describes Satan, okay? So a deacon's wife does not need to be, well, she doesn't need to be like Satan. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Glad y'all think that a little bit humorous. I'll stop. Not slanderers. They need to be sober-minded. And then lastly, they need to be faithful in all things, now, what's interesting are these are, are basically the same qualifications that we find for elders and for deacons, which seem to suggest that, that these particular spiritual characteristics, these are things that all believers should exhibit in their life. Every single one of us who, who claim the name of Jesus as our Savior, who, who walk after him and follow after him, these are the things that should be in our lives. I mean, we should be people who are worthy of respect. We should be people who are not slanderers, who are not little Satans. We should be people who are sober-minded. We should be people who are faithful in all things. What's interesting, as you read this passage, you might think, well, what, what does some of the other biblical texts say about the qualifications of deacons? Well, you just read the only passage that speaks to the qualifications of deacons. 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 13. It's the only place in the Bible where these qualifications for deacons are listed. In fact, this particular passage and one verse in Philippians, Philippians 1, 1, are the only uses of the word deacon where it's elevated to an office in the church. <laughs> In Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, as Paul is greeting the church at Philippi, he mentions uh, the work of the overseer and deacons. It's the only other place in the New Testament where the office of deacon is officially recognized. What's the point? The point is this. There should be no question that a deacon must be biblically qualified to serve. They also must be a leading servant. Not only do they need to be qualified, but they need to be a leading servant. So to understand how the deacon must be a leading servant, we, we really need to see how the word deacon or diakonos in the Greek is used. Now there's several different words for deacon uh, or its relative terms uh, in the New Testament. Sometimes it's used as servant. Sometimes in the verb form it's used as to serve. About a hundred times in the New Testament we find this word or a derivative of it used. Originally, the term was used to describe menial tasks like waiting on tables. Many times the word is used in this general sense of serving food. That's interesting, isn't it? You ever wonder why you call the person who waits on you at the restaurant a server? They're fulfilling the role of a deacon. Let that sink in. In John 2, 5, where we find Jesus' first recorded miracle in the scripture at the wedding at Cana, we find his mother using this word, deacon. His mother said to the servants, the deacons, those who were waiting on the guest at the feast, do whatever he tells you. Man, is that a good word for deacons? Do whatever I tell you to do. Over the course of time, this, this word deacon seemed to have broadened to denote service in the church. Like in 1 Corinthians 12, 5, where it says that there are varieties of service, or some translations say a variety of ministry, but the same Lord. So we, we see this word deacon referring to Christian service. 
Secondly, the terms were also used in a more specific sense. In Romans 12, service, this same word, is included as a specific spiritual gift. Paul also reminds the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 16, Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts in Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves to the service, to the deaconing of the saints, to ministering to the saints. It seems to be a specific spiritual gift. And then the last usage of the word that we find in the Bible, this word deacons, referring to the office of deacon, as we find here in 1 Timothy. So let me sum this up. The Bible teaches us that everyone is a deacon in a general sense. We're all to be servants. Jesus equates following him with serving him in John 12, 26. So in essence, to follow after Jesus is to be in his service. The Bible also teaches us that some are spiritually gifted for service. They, they have um, the ability to lead others in the area of service. They serve as an example for us to follow. And then lastly, the Bible teaches us that some are called to the office of deacon. That is, they are to work alongside and assist the pastor or the elders, freeing them to focus on the ministry of the word and the ministry of prayer. They lead in carrying out the vision and the mission of the church. They are leading servants. So a deacon needs to be qualified. A deacon also needs to be a leading servant. And lastly, a deacon must be faithful. A deacon must be faithful. You'll notice in verse 13 of 1 Timothy 3, it says there that those who serve well, those who serve well, well, serving well as a deacon comes with the reward of a high standing. Some people say that's putting them up on a pedestal, but that's not of their own doing because servants are humble by nature. But yet they're well received and looked on favorably. They have a high standing. They also have great confidence in the faith. You could say that faithful deacons through their faithful service, continue to be empowered to be faithful deacons. It builds on itself. So this leads to the question, what are the responsibilities of a faithful deacon? Interestingly enough, the Bible does not give us a list of responsibilities for deacons. Nowhere in the New Testament does it say a deacon must do this and must do this and must do this. It does say, say what he must be, right? It speaks to his character, but it doesn't speak to the actions of a deacon. Obviously, service is their main focus, but, but how does that translate into specific actions? Well, I want you to turn with me, if you will, back to the book of Acts. In Acts chapter 6, <laughs> in Acts chapter 6, we find what I believe to be the founding of deacon ministry in the church. At the least, it serves as a prototype for faithful service, for being a faithful deacon. Here's what's happening in Acts chapter 6. The church is growing by leaps and bounds, right? We know on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 plus people were added to the church, and this continues all throughout the book of Acts. Thousands and thousands of people coming to faith in Christ. So the church is expanding. So as they're increasing in number, a problem arises within the body of Christ. You see, there were some Hellenists. These were Greek-speaking Jews, and they had a complaint against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. I don't think I should have to say this, but ministering to, wid to widows is kind of a core thing for a believer, right? It's a command of God. So here you have widows who are being neglected. This is a bad thing. So what happens? Well, here's what happens. The 12, the apostles, summon together the disciples, all of the disciples, and they say to them in verse 2 of chapter 6, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve, to deacon tables. It's not right for us that we would have to set aside what God has called us to do to take care of this issue. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to pick out from among you seven people, men of good repute, who are full of the Holy Spirit, who are full of wisdom, 
and we will appoint them to take care of this problem, to handle uh, the administration of the distribution of food to the Hellenistic widows. So that's exactly what they do. They set aside seven people. Some of these people you may have heard of in Scripture, like Stephen, who, you're going to, who if you continue reading in Acts, you're going to read about in chapter 7, who is proclaiming the message of Christ and who is martyred because of his preaching. Stephen says of Stephen that he's a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Some of those names you don't recognize, but here's what's interesting about those names. Those are all names of Greek-speaking Jews who had the complaint, the Hellenists, the Greek-speaking Jews. So who do they appoint to take care of this? Their own people, right? those who could sympathize with them, those who could encourage them, those who would be most responsible to fulfill this task. So they set them before the apostles in verse 6, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. The, the church gathered. They set apart and commissioned these seven men to tend to the administration of this particular ministry. The men were chosen based on their reputation within their community, their spiritual maturity, and their godly wisdom. They were chosen for the purpose of assisting the leaders and serving the people. I believe this is exactly what deacons are called to today, to assist the leaders and serve the people. Deacons are, first of all, to meet the needs according to the word. Deacons are to meet the needs according to the word. There was a real need present in Acts chapter 6, and that was a need that had the potential to upset the effectiveness of the church. One pastor said, according to God's word, the deacons meet needs. That's the primary meaning of the word diakonos. It's spiritual service aimed at meeting a specific ministry need. These men were meeting a need that was a, a specific command by God to take care of the widows. Not only do they meet the needs according to the word, but deacons are to support the ministry of the word. The deacons were meeting that need in Acts chapter 6, but because these widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food, the apostles were being taken away from their overall leadership responsibilities. What did the apostles say here in Acts 6? Should we, what? Should we give up preaching the word of God to serve tables? This is a critical role that deacons play in the church. Deacons come alongside the pastor and assist the pastor so that the pastor can lead in the responsibilities that God has given him. These deacons here, Stephen and all the others, freed the apostles to devote themselves to prayer and to the word. And that's a huge deal. This is not a second block, power block in the church. This is not a body of leaders competing with the pastor to provide overall leadership in the church. Here in Acts 6, these deacons are helping make sure that pastors are leading with the word as God had designed. So they support the ministry of the word. They meet the needs according to the word. And lastly, they unify the body around the word. As deacons are meeting needs, as they are supporting the ministry of the word, they also seek to unify the body around the word. I mean, if you really think about what's happening here in Acts chapter 6, as the church is expanding and growing and seeing real effectiveness happen around them, the unity of the church was at stake. And can I say one thing that I know very sure, that I'm very sure of? Whenever there is disunity in the church, I can promise you, you will not be effective in the gospel ministry. This was a big deal. The physical neglect was causing spiritual disunity. Christians were beginning to complain against each other. There was tension among the body of believers, and these deacons were appointed to be, as one person said, shock absorbers for the church. They were to squelch this rising disunity in the church. And how did they do that? They met the needs. They supported the ministry. They sought to unify the body. To do that, they had to be faithful. They had to be faithful. As we think about deacon ministry, we need to understand that deacons must be qualified. They must be leading servants. 
and they must be faithful. Somewhere along the way, many churches have swerved from God's design. In many places, deacons are not leading servants. They are ruling leaders. They think that they have the authority. Some even think they have the responsibility to rule over the pastor and to rule over the congregation. Friends, that is not and has never been God's design for any leader in the church. Any leader, not just deacons. I'm talking about pastors, elders, all the like. That is not the way God designed it. There is only one who has authority in the church, and he purchased that right with his blood. There is only one who has the right to set the agenda for the church, and his name is Jesus. I am a servant leader, and deacons, you are leading servants, and we are both under the authority of Christ in his church. The truth is that faithful deacons, as one pastor put it, are not small-minded men engrossed in turf warfares, caring about their area or their rights in the church, advocating for their cause, lobbying for their corner in the church. Deacons see the overall mission of the church and work to help the church stay focused on that mission, realizing their ministry is a part of that ministry. When we lead the church as God intended, pastors and deacons alike, God does something amazing. If you still have your Bible open to Acts chapter 6, look at verse number 7. We had a problem. We had a biblical solution to the problem. And here's what God does with it. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. You see, when we lead the church in a biblical way, God can do amazing things in us and in our community. Church, if we want to make a gospel impact in our community, then we need to be a church that is led by servant leaders and leading servants that have a mission mindset and Christ-like character. I was reading here recently an interesting article in the Baptist and Reflector about our new IMB president, Paul Chipwood. The article said, at the age of two, his parents divorced, and Thomas Chipwood and his three sons moved to Jellico to live with his grandparents for a while. Later, his dad found a nearby place for him and his sons to live. Jellico, located on the state line of Kentucky and Tennessee, was home to the Chipwood uh, family until... He, until Paul moved to Louisville, Kentucky, to attend seminary. His recollections of his childhood are filled with memories of First Baptist Church Jellico. He recalled that when he was four years old, deacons from First Baptist came to their house, knocked on their door, and invited his dad to worship services on Sunday. He began taking us to church, and it became a way of life, Chitwood said. A few years later, the church's pastor came to visit them and shared the gospel with Paul's older brother, Lynn. Paul and his younger brother, Dana, listened in on the conversation, and all three of the boys accepted Christ and were baptized at First Baptist Church. His dad is still a member of First Baptist Church, Jellico. The church had a major impact on Paul's life. He said, the church helped raise us, he recalled. We went to Sunday school, vacation Bible school, and youth group. My first opportunity for ministry took place there. The story also mentioned the fact that a deacon at First Baptist Church was the one to invite him to preach for the first time on a Wednesday night. Now here's what is striking about the story. At the end, he says this. He says, I would not be the president of the International Mission Board today were it not for deacons of First Baptist Church Jellico knocking on our door and inviting us to church. The truth of the matter is deacons make a difference in the life of the church. They make a difference in the gospel impact of the church and the community. And by God's grace, deacons make a difference to the point that it would lead to the one who is leading our mission effort to the ends of the earth. It was because of deacons' ministry that a man of God 
serves as our president of the International Mission Board. Let that sink in for a minute. That's why church leadership matters. That's why biblical leadership matters. It matters for those who have never heard the name of Jesus. A deacon must be. He must be qualified. He must be a leading servant. And he must be faithful. 